I'm continuing our series, Selfless. Selfless. A new year, less me. Right? What's the saying? It's a new year, a new me. The world's always telling us we got to have a new, you got to recreate yourself. You got to be somebody new, but not us. A new me, a new year, less me of me. In fact, uh, I did, last night I was, uh, you know, on Instagram checking out some sports stuff, and I saw one organization called Bleacher Report. They uh, announced stuff on sports, and they talked about the Bills Mafia. This is literally the title that says this, Bills Mafia is one of the wildest fan bases in the NFL, but it is also one of the most selfless. How cool is that? I was like, wow, a Bills Mafia. Go Bills. Yeah. Go Buffalo. Lord, hear us, our fans. We need to win. You know, I'm just kidding. Anyways, selfless. The world encourages selfishness, but not as Christ followers. We're called to something different. Jesus said, deny yourself. Don't just glutton and don't just get everything you can. Deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. In fact, John the Baptist, someone who prepared the way for Jesus, he said this in John 3.30. He said, he, that speaking of Jesus, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less in less. That's like the total opposite, right? Don't, don't we learn and don't our natural instinct, my natural instinct is I want to become greater and greater. I want to know more and more. I want to have more and more. I want to be someone who's better and better. And I want to have it all and I want to have it all. We want to become greater and greater. But that's the opposite of what we're called to be. Right, uh, John the Baptist, he actually goes on to say, they were like, some of his followers were like, John, aren't you mad that people are leaving us to follow Jesus? And you know what he said? He said, it brings me great joy to have less and less followers in Jesus to have more and more. The complete opposite of what we're taught. Today, I want to talk, uh, last week I talked about, or two weeks ago I talked about being bold in witness, right? The series Selfless, bold in witness. Last week I talked about faithful in service. I really love that message. This week I'm talking about extravagant in generosity. Being extravagant in generosity. Generosity could take many, many forms, not just financially, but in serving and loving and kind and, and doing work for people and helping people. Extravagant in generosity. What I want to do is read a specific story, uh, but I just want to uh, help understand the story. The story I'm going to read, there's a couple instances that happens throughout the Gospels, and it could be confusing. I, I do speak on one of these stories a lot, and, it, and the story I, I talk on a lot is, is a sinful woman enters the house of Simon the Pharisee, and she breaks a jar of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet. This is actually a slightly different instance, uh, because it doesn't happen at Simon the Pharisee's house. It happens at a man named Lazarus's house, who is dead, and Jesus rose from the dead. And his sister, Mary, does a very similar thing. She pours perfume on Jesus' feet. And I want to read that story of when they're eating dinner at Lazarus' house and Mary pours perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, some commentaries I read, they actually title this story, Love's Extravagance. Isn't that cool? Love's extravagant. And I thought, what better story to talk about when we talk about being extravagant and giving than a story of a woman who loved Jesus so much she did a great act of generosity towards Jesus. So we're going to read this story in John chapter 12, starting in verse 1, and it says this. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man who he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made of the, from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Ezekiel, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold in the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. From this story, I want to talk about some principles of generosity. Principles of generosity. I don't really like the word principles. I feel like it reminds me of school and a lecture and going to the principal's office. However, it actually is a really good word because principles are a foundational truths of something, right? A principle is the foundational truth. And so if we want to learn to be more generous people, 
we should learn the truths that generosity, the foundation of generosity, is built upon. And so I want to talk about some principles of generosity. This is the first one. Selfishness is an enemy of generosity. Some people would say selfishness is the enemy of generosity. Now, what's one thing you never have to teach your kids? You never have to teach them how to be selfish, right? You don't have to teach your kids to grab a toy from another kid to say, that's mine, that's mine, that, right? They know that. It's an instinct of ours. It's how we're normally bent is to be selfish. My daughter, she's a little over one. She's like one and a half. And she says, me, 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 okay? Me, 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 right? I, I try to sneak into the kitchen and try to get a snack without my wife knowing and all of a sudden, me, me, and she's right there. I'm like, how do you know I'm eating a snack? Like, shh, you know, the other kid's coming in. Me, what are you eating, Daddy? He's like, guys, be quiet. You know, I pull up my phone to go on my phone, and she, me, 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 dada, dada, me, me. She wants my phone. My three-year-old, he'll be playing, and somehow he's got, they got the sense. I don't know if kids, I don't know how God's created them, but they got the sense that his sister picked up a toy that is his, but he was not using, right? And he'll just put his toy down, walk right over, and grab it out of her hands, you know? And then it begins. Mine, mine, that's mine first. I was playing it in a fight. And there, there comes a point in all parents, right, that you don't care about justice. You just want some silence, you know? It's like, I don't care whose it is. I'll throw it out the window. You just stop crying, right? But there's this selfish, natural bent that we have. Now, let me ask you a question. Why wasn't this amazing, extraordinary act that Mary performed on Jesus, why wasn't it celebrated? It wasn't celebrated because there's an enemy of generosity and it's selfishness. Judas said in verse 4 and 5, he said, But Judas, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Now, a year's wage, some versions say 300 denarii. Back then, a denarii was like the minimum wage. The denarii was one day's salary. So 300 denarii, uh, you know, you take out weekends, holidays, days off, 300 work days a year roughly. That's a year's wage. Now, what's interesting is there's another story about Jesus, and there's 5,000 people, and they're all hungry, and Jesus said, let's feed the people. And Philip, he says, Two, 200 denarii would barely fill, fill, feed all these people. So it's interesting to think that you could sell this perfume, get 300 denarii, and with that money feed well over 5,000 people. So Judas's remarks are kind of like interesting. It's kind of like, wow, what a sweetheart. You know, he's a good guy, that Judas. I mean, always thinking of the poor, and we should have sold it and given to the poor and help him, right? But selfishness can be disguised in a plethora of ways. Because the ver next verse, verse 6 says, not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Selfishness can appear in many, many ways. Some people, selfishness appears in how they talk about people who are generous. Sometimes we're critical of generous people. We say things like, well, I mean, they just gave that because they're rich. Well, I would give that much money if I had that much money too, right? You know, if I had money just lying around, I would do it too. Oh, the pastor, he only speaks on generosity because he wants more people to give, right? And we get critical. It's funny because the same message I'll speak on giving, I get the people who are generous telling me how good it was and the people who are not trying to argue that I wasn't quite right theologically. Right? It's interesting though. Selfishness could take a lot of forms of generosity. But you ever think about this? Who put Judas in charge of the money? Well, who, who was the leader of the disciples? Who picked every single one disciple by hand, by name? Jesus. And Jesus knew Judas was a thief, yet Jesus put him in charge of the money. And I wonder if Jesus put him in charge of money because he wanted to give him an opportunity to overcome the enemy of, of generosity. He wanted him to overcome his selfishness. Now, you might say, well, that's not very nice of Jesus. If he knew he was struggled in this area, why would Jesus tempt him like that, right? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. We are all tempted to be selfish. Isn't that true? We're all tempted 
to be selfish. Even for me, I was thinking about this message, and I was so selfish. I said, well, you know, it's, I, I, I don't know if I want to preach this message because, like, I, I'm a really good speaker, and I wish everyone could hear how good of a speaker I really am. And I'm thinking, like, I, you know, should I preach this? And God's like, what are you talking about? You're talking about being selfish, and all I care is what people think about me. I'm not speaking for me. I'm speaking to glorify God. We can all be selfish. We all struggle with temptation. Proverbs 21, 26 says, all day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. That phrase, craves and craves, it actually is talking about they crave the craving of wanting more. They crave the urge. They crave the feeling. They enjoy the feeling of wanting more. It's an addiction of more. How many of us know that getting more of something never is the true fulfillment in life? More money, more things, more fame, more followers, more popularity, more knowledge. It, it never, there's always a little more you could get. Selfishness is never satisfied. But selflessness is an amazing way to live our lives. Principles of generosity. Foundational truths. Number one, selfishness is an enemy of generosity. Number two, love is a friend of generosity. Selfishness is the enemy. Love is the friend. For the first principle, we looked at Judas. Now I want to look at Mary. Mary's brother Lazarus was dead two months earlier. Two months earlier, he died they buried him in a tomb. They wrapped him in like mummy's clothes, you know. I don't know if it was really mummy's clothes, but that's a cartoon I watched as a kid, you know. And he comes out as a mummy and Jesus goes four days later and he comes out of the tomb and he comes out and he raises Jesus to life. He was dead and he's alive. And they're eating dinner at his house. But feeding Jesus a meal, it just, it just wasn't enough. How could it suffice for raising my brother from the dead? And Mary, not knowing what else to do because of this love she has for Jesus, takes quite possibly the most valuable possession she had. And she pours it, all of it, not holding any of it back on Jesus' feet. Now this is an extremely extravagant act of generosity. I mean, a year's worth of money dumped on somebody's feet. I mean, he is going to get them dirty as soon as he gets up. They're going to stink again. I mean, you have to use the whole thing. Couldn't a few drops work? Maybe even just a few ounces. Not all 12 ounces, four ounces. I mean, how big were his feet that he needed six ounces of perfume on each foot, right? I mean, did she have to do it all? But an extravagant gift could always be viewed as wasteful. In fact, part of the definition of extravagant is wasteful. And to some people, to Judas and others, Mary's extravagant act of generosity was a waste. We could do something else with it, but not to Mary. Because her brother was dead, and now he's alive. And what's a little thing like a year's worth of salary when you raised my brother to life? Guess what else was extravagant? God giving up his own son, his perfect, blameless, sinless son, to die a horrific death so that we could be forgiven of our sins and given new life in Christ. How can I be anything less than extravagant in generosity when I think about what Jesus has saved me from? When I think about the life he has given me, the family, the friends, the community. When I think about what Jesus has done for me, the love that comes out is a friend of generosity. It's easy to be generous. Number one, selfishness is the enemy of generosity. Number two, love is the friend of generosity. Number three, trust is the start of generosity. Trust is the start. How do we become generous? Where do we start? We start with trust, or you could say with faith in God as our provider. Luke 6.38 says this, Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Notice Jesus did not say keep. 
He did not say hoard. He did not say count it all out to make sure you have enough and then give some away. He said give. Why did he say give? Because he knows we have a choice. We have control over this area of our life. We can either choose to give or choose to keep. And Jesus said to give and trust that God will provide all your needs. What happens when we trust God and give? What you give will return to you in full. Press down, shaking together to make room for more and running over. Now those terms are farming terms. And when you would farm thousands of years ago, you'd have people who would pick up the harvest and the, the wheat and they'd put it in a, bar, a basket and they'd carry it to the barn. Now, if you were a worker paid to do this, you wouldn't fill your basket up all the way. I mean, you got to do this all day. They didn't work eight-hour days. They worked like as long as there was light, like 12-hour days. And so you would maybe do half your basket, three-quarters of your basket. But God had a rule. He said, listen, when you drop grain on the ground during the harvest, leave it on the ground for poor people. So a poor person could come and pick up the scraps and feed their family. And if you were a poor person, you'd only have one basket. You'd only have one opportunity. And so how would you pick up the grain? Well, you'd pick up the grain, and then you would press it down so you get a little more. And then you would shake it to make room for more. And you'd fill it to overflowing so you could take it home to feed your family. That's what Jesus is talking about. In fact, let me put it in today's words. How many of you have ever gone on a hot day and got an icy, right? A slushy from 7-Eleven, right? And if you know what you're doing when you get in a slushy, I like all red, so I get the red one, and I fill up, and a little over halfway, what do you got to do? You got to stop, and you got to kind of shake it down and get the air out so you get more in there, right? Then if you're smart, you fill it up all the way. But the really smart people, what do we do? We put that little bubble cap on, right? Right? Gives you like another inch of icy, and then you fill it up to the top and it starts to floor. Then if you still have Jesus doing a work in your heart, you turn around and take a sip, and then you fill it back up again, right? That's kind of the same thing. We fill it up to overflowing, get as much as you can in there. My point is this. It takes trust to give. It takes faith in God that he will provide. This is why trust is the start of generosity. I trust that as I tithe, as I give, as I'm generous, God will provide all of my needs. Another pastor who I, I listen to a lot and I read his stuff, uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he says this, what you keep is all you have, and what you give, God multiplies. It's amazing how generous people seem to prosper. Even if they don't know God, Generous people, it's a principle just like gravity. When you're generous, God allows you to prosper. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, the, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, the first fruits are like the first uh, of our increase. Like it's the first of your increase. So, uh, you know, we worship God with the first a lot. We worship God with Sundays, the first day of the week. A lot of people worship God with the first part of their day. Every morning they spend time with God. We worship God with the first part of our year. We start off the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. We worship God with the first. Me and my wife, uh, we just personally, on the first day of every year, we give a generous gift. We just, January 1st, the first thing I do is I give a generous gift. Uh, why? Because I like to honor God uh, with my year. That's just something we do. And we worship God with the first of our fruits, the first of our increase, the first of every paycheck, the first of, uh, you know, your COVID-19 relief package, the first of raises, right? We worship God with the first. But it takes trust. It takes faith to tithe. It takes trust to be generous, that if I help somebody else, I could still provide for my family. How do we start this process of becoming a generous person, we start by trusting in God, our provider, that he will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory. It all starts with trusting God with something that we call the tithe. The tithe comes from the Hebrew word that means one-tenth or ten percent. The tithe is the first ten percent. We give it back to God. You give it to the church you belong to where you're fed spiritually. We give it first before we know we have enough. We give it first before we count, pay all our bills, and we have just have 10% lying around. I mean, whoever has 10% just lying around anyways. But you give it first, right? We give it first. Why? Because it takes 
trust in God that he will provide. It takes trust that with God's blessing, I'll do more with 90% than I could do with 100% without God's blessing. Now, here's an interesting statistic. A couple, uh, these are really interesting. These are from this nonprofit source. They do these statistics and whatever, however they get this stuff. And they, one of them is this. Three to 5% of Americans who give to the local church tithe. Now, I just want you to understand the statistic. It's not just three to 5% of Americans. It's three to 5% of the people who are giving tithe. That means 95 to 90% of the people who give do not tithe, Okay. Now, remember what I said? It starts with the tithe. The start, this, uh, this journey of generosity starts with the tithe. Okay, so 95, 97% of the people who give don't tithe. But there's another statistic. 77% of those who do tithe, so out of the few who do tithe, three quarters or more of them give 11 to 20% or more of their money to the church. The people who have learned to trust God with the tithe are sometimes doubling what they give because they've developed this trust in God. It's amazing. Why is that? Because it all starts with trust, with faith in God that he will provide. Mary gave Jesus an extravagant gift by pouring a year's salary of perfume. How absurd is that? On Jesus' feet. Now, Mark tells the same story that I read in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of Mark tells the same story, but it records something else Jesus says. And in Mark 14, 19, it says this. About the same story we read, about her pouring the perfume, Jesus said this. He goes, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Her extravagant act of love is now being told all over the place. I mean, do you realize that Jesus prophesied about my message today? I'm talking about this lady to reach more people because of her extravagant act of generosity, her generosity still living thousands of years later, affecting thousands and thousands of people's lives. Mary was generous, and she didn't know the full effects of her generosity. She gave before she knew. Jesus said, you're preparing me for my burial. She didn't know. Jesus wasn't going to be anointed before he died. She anointed Jesus, the Son of God, before he was crucified on the cross. She didn't know where her gift was going. And many of you give to church, and we don't know where every penny's going. We don't know where every little thing's going. We don't know that it's going to the teenager who when we met him, he was depressed. He was struggling in life. And now all of a sudden he's serving in church and he's excited to come every week and he's happy and he's using words I've never heard him use before. And some Sundays he's getting to church before me because he's so excited to be here. We don't know that every penny is going to help people like that. We don't know about how about those people who just became members and their amazing stories of how they found church and how they found God. Like one of them, Alex, he was just coming to church because his fiance, a girlfriend, was bringing him to church. And all of a sudden through the process, he met Jesus, he's serving, he's a member, he's growing, he has a new community. We don't know. It's amazing. We don't know about the families and the people who are struggling. And they watch every single week. And it's because of the encouragement that we give that they're able to endure isolation in this pandemic. But there's a trust. And there's an effect that when we're generous, we affect lives. When Mary poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, it said the perfume filled the house. It changed the atmosphere. Every person around smelt something different. Every person around, it changed what they were smelling. And when we're generous, when we do acts of generosity, it doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. It touches people. It encourages people. It helps people. When we're generous, we're helping our church reach thousands and thousands of people in western New York. We will do it, and we will continue to be generous, and we will continue to be a light in the darkness, and our generosity is going to change the atmosphere. It's going to help people, and it's going to encourage people in western New York. Let me end with this. John 3, 16. One of the most popular scripture verses. Remember the wrestler used to have like 
Austin 3.16. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Why did God give? Because he loved. Love is the friend of generosity. How did God give? Well, God gave his first. God gave his only. God gave his best. God gave his sinless, blameless, blameless, perfect son. And he gave him for us. Not only did God give his first and his best, but God gave him before we loved God. God gave him before we responded. Just like when we give, God asks us to give our first, but we give it before all of our needs are met. We give it before we know how everything's going to shake out. We give it first because there's a trust and there's a love of our acts of generosity. What am I saying? I'm saying when we learn these principles that I'm giving in generous, that I'm becoming a generous person, I'm saying I trust God and he will provide all of my needs. I could give him my first and my best knowing that God will provide. And that's how we become extravagant in generosity. Now maybe today you're listening to this message and, and you think, This is absolutely nutty. This is crazy. You say, Jonathan, you have lost your mind. You are mad. Well, I got news for you. You're right. This is crazy. This is the complete opposite that everything we're taught in life. I took corporate finance. I majored in finance in college. I was in those classes, and I know it doesn't add up. Giving everything away does not make you rich in this world's economy. But when you follow Jesus, we aren't called to be selfish. We're called to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him. And we don't have to follow the economy of this world. We got a new economy, a new kingdom we're a part of, and God is able to provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory. You might say, okay, 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 even if that nonsense, that crazy talk is right, even if you're right, Jonathan, do you know what it would take for me to start being generous? I mean, I'm in a bind right now. I got debt right now. I'm worried about my job. I got this going on and this going on and this going on. I, do you know the changes I would have to make to give? I mean, geez, I would have to do this and I would have to put, I would have to make God the priority over my kids and God the priority over what I eat and God the priority over my car. God, yes, that's what I'm saying. That's the beauty of tithing. That's the beauty of generosity because it forces us to put God first in every single area in our lives. There is nothing else we can do that forces us to put God first in every area except for when we give generously to God. Because when I give, It forces me to make God the priority in every area of my life. As I end, maybe today two things. First, you're listening to this and you say, well, I don't really know Jesus. But it's amazing that he died for me. I'd like to know him. I want to pray for you. The other people I want to pray for is some of us, we've struggled with this. We're Christians, we go to church, we believe in Jesus. And man, there's just a struggle. I honestly believe most of us, we want to be generous. We would love to say we give and we give and we help neighbors and we help friends and we help people in need and we just help the homeless. And we want to be generous. But there's an enemy. There's this natural bent of selfishness that is always fighting against it. And maybe... You want some prayer that you could start this journey of trusting God, even in your money, even in your time, even in your gifting, to be generous, and God will provide. I want to pray for you. Lord, I just thank you for anyone watching online or anybody who's here in person. And Lord, I just ask for anyone who doesn't know you, Lord, that right now, if they want to know you for the first time, they could just say a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I know I'm not perfect. I know I make mistakes. 
And the only way to be right with God, to be forgiven of my sins, is through Jesus. And so, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and on the third day you rose again. And if you believe that, you say a similar prayer like that in your heart, you confess it, that Jesus is Lord, and you ask him to forgive you. The Bible tells us he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And there's other people here who are struggling with generosity. And there's an urge to be generous, but it's hard. There's an enemy fighting against us called selfishness. And I feel like my selfishness always wins. Lord, I just ask that you'd begin to touch our hearts. Lord, that you'd bring a trust in us, a boldness to begin to trust you like never before. And Lord, you would help us to be generous because of the love you poured out to us that we would love you back with our acts of generosity. Lord, we thank you that you're with each of us. We thank you for your faithfulness and that you make a way in our lives. In Jesus' name.